So they keep talking, and 437, Aragorn tells Amer and such, you know, I, I cannot desert my friends at the bottom of the page. <clears throat> Me, Miriam and Pippin, not while there's hope, and Elmer says, there is no hope. There was nobody else. Okay, we slaughtered all the orcs. And then top of 438, he says, okay, then, then what happened? That is, they didn't get ditched by the orcs. We know that because we've been following the orcs. And you say they're not with the bodies. I, I don't know. Maybe they were slain and burnt. Okay. Amr says, uh, no orc escape. Um, they were dressed like we were. What's his point? You rode right past us. I hadn't thought of that. Okay. And then Elmer says, middle of page 438. It is hard to be sure of anything among so many marvels. The world is all grown strange. Elf and dwarf in company walk in our daily fields. Folks speak with the lady of the wood yet live. The sword comes back to war that was broken in the long ages ere the fathers of our fathers rode into the mark. And what that means is the sword is older than the people of the Rohirrim. I mean, there was no Rohan back when Elendil cut the ring off Sauron's finger and such. And he says, how shall a man judge what to do in such time? What does it mean in such time? When everything's turned upside down, when fairy tales go walking among us in the real world, how, how do you know what to do? How do you decide what to do? Aragorn, as he ever has judged, good and ill have not changed since yesteryear, nor are they one thing among elves and dwarves and another among men. In other words, good and ill, good and evil, haven't changed since yesteryear. That doesn't mean since last year or the year before. It means we could go all the way back to the beginning of Sauron in the Second Age. Or we could go back even farther than that. We could go back to the First Age with Melkor, Morgoth. Good and ill, good and evil, he says, are always the same. They don't change. Nor are they different for, for one group of people than for somebody else. He says, good and evil... It's the same whether you're a dwarf, or an elf, or a man, or a hobbit. See, Tolkien is not a moral relativist. He's, he's not going to say, well, this culture's ideas are all fine for this culture, and this culture's are all, de all fine, ideas are all fine for this culture, and this culture's ideas are all fine for this culture, even though those ideas, all three, are at war with each other. He says, no, there is one, you know, absolute good, and there's an absolute evil, so to speak, okay? And he says, it is a man's part to discern them, to discern, to literally separate good from evil, whether or as much in the golden wood, Lothlorien, as in his own house. You know, from Amor's perspective, in the fairy tale world, Lothlorien is in your own home. You got to be able to tell right from wrong. Amor, yeah, 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 yeah. True indeed. I don't doubt you nor the deed which my heart would do. He says, but I, I am not free to do as I would. In other words, I'm not like you, Aragorn. Why? How did Aragorn reply when Amor said, asked, whom do you serve? I serve no man, Aragorn says. Amor is like, but I do. <laughs> I am just the third marshal of the Rittermark. I have to serve my king. Aragorn, I don't think your law was made for this kind of situation. And he's not saying, therefore, we can ban the law. He's saying, you don't have a law that encompasses this problem. He says, oh, and by the way, I'm not a stranger. I've been here before. I knew your father when he says, I haven't seen you before, but I have spoken with him and your father and with it and son of Thingol. Okay. He says, never before would a high lord of Rowan have stopped me 
from what I'm doing. All right? But he says, you got to choose, man. You got to choose quickly. So, AM Air provides horses on the proviso, on the promise that they will be returned. So, when you no longer need the horses, you got to ride to the Golden Hall and return them. He does. Okay? So, they ride up to where the piles of orcs are burning, 442 and following. And they ride all around. They, they look at the forest. Uh, let's see here. They start a fire. Um, Gimli does. And 442. Legless says, Kelleborn warned us not to go far into Fangor. Do you know why, Aragorn? What are the fables of the forest that Boromir's heard? Aragorn says, I've heard lots of tables, uh, lots of fables and tales and such. He goes, but if you don't know about the dangers of Fangor, how am I going to? Because Legolas is a wood elf again. Legolas says, yeah, but you've journeyed farther than I have. Legolas pretty much only stayed in Mirkwood until he went down to Rivendell. The only real journey he's gone on is this one. He says, I've heard nothing of this in my life. Only songs about the ants and such. Okay. So, chapter three, we're going to skip. All right. The Urukai. It's just about, you know, what happens with Mary and Pippin while they're in the company of the orcs and how they escape from the orcs. Chapter four, Treebeard. They escape from the orcs. They go not too far into Fangorn. Um, and pages 463, 462, 63. They climb up this hill. And at the top of the hill, they see a shaft of sunlight come through. So, you know, it kind of gives them a, a, a um, vantage point to look around a bit. And Mary says, page 463 there, the wind's changing. It's turned east again. It feels cool up here. Pippin, yes, I'm afraid this is only a passing gleam. And it will all go gray again. In other words, this is just a brief respite. And pretty soon, things are going to be bad. What a pity. The shaggy old forest looks so different in the sunlight. I almost felt I liked the place. And they hear this big booming voice. The character of Treebeard... The voice of the character of Treebeard is based upon Tolkien's good friend C.S. Lewis, who apparently had this really loud, deep, booming voice. Okay. Anyways, he says, turn around, let me have a look at you. They turn around, and there's this big tree, and it reaches down and picks them up. Why? Because the face is like 14, 15 feet off the ground, and they're, you know, this tall. So he picks them up and holds them to his face. Uh, Pippin, who are you? <laughs> what are you? He says, well, I'm an ant. Well, that's what they call me anyways. He says, you can call me Treebeard or Fangorn. Either one will do. So he starts going through the lists of living creatures. Okay. First the four, the three peoples, eldest of all, the elf children, then the dwarf, then the ant, then man. And that's telling us the order in which these living creatures were awakened, right? So elves first, then dwarves, then ints, then humans, and he starts going through the list. I don't find you in this list anywhere. And they're like, you know, we're always left out of those old things. So Pippin throws in a half line, okay, or a line, all right? They tell Treebeard their names, and Treebeard asks, bottom of 465, what is Gandalf up to? Mary says, there's a lot going on, and he, 466, asks, and notice the verb tense, 
And did you know, Gandalf? Because how did Treebeard ask this question? Present tense. What is Gandalf up to? Did you know Gandalf? Yes, I do know him. Notice he doesn't pick up on Mary's use of past tense and reply in the past tense. He still replies in the present tense. Okay. The only wizard that really cares about trees. Do you know him? And then he asks the question in present tense. Pippin, we did. He was a great friend. He was our guide. So you have these dueling tenses going on. Mary and Pippin, referring to Gandalf in past tense, Treebeard in present tense. And so Treebeard says, finish the little next speech, you speak of Master Gandalf as if he was in a story that had come to an end. In other words, why do you keep using past tense? And they say, because he has fallen out of the story. Now notice two things there. One, Gandalf is a character in a story. Why? Because as Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage, and we each have our part to play upon it. That is in the story. Treebeard, well, I, don't, I can't believe that, you know. Tell me. Okay. So, um, he says, I'm going to take you to my home. And they tell him, they talk to him as he carries them. All right. Um, I'm going to skip a bunch. He takes them to his house. He gives them int draft, spelled D R A U G H T, which is the water that, you know, he drinks and stuff. And we're going to see something happen to them as a result of drinking this. And it is described as being slightly alcoholic. Okay. Um, they get a nap and stuff. 472, 73. So they talk to him about Saruman, that Saruman imprisoned Gandalf, but Saruman's gone bad and such. Um, he talks to them a, bit, a little bit about Ent Wives. We're going to skip some of that. We'll come back to it later. And then 473, Pippin asks, who is Saruman? Now, why does Pippin not know? Was Pippin in the Council of Elrond? No, he wasn't. Do you know anything about his history? And he goes on and talks about him being a wizard. He said, I don't know anything more than that. He says, he first came after the great ships came over the sea. And the great ships coming over the sea, I said in my first class, that's when the elves came back from Valinor after the elves did some really bad things, or what's called kin slaying, elves killing elves in Valinor over what are called the Silmarils. Some of the elves sailed across the ocean. They killed the people at the harbor who usually manned the ships and everything, killed those elves, and came back over the sea. It could be referring to that, or it could be referring to the, when the men of Westernessa came from the Isle of Westernessa to Middle Earth. I think it's referring to the first, to the elves. Anyways, talks about, you know, he used to be a good neighbor, blah, blah, blah. But now he's not. Now he's killing trees. Bottom of 473. I think now, I think I now understand what he's up to. He's plotting to become a power. What does he mean by a power? And notice it's capitalized. He means like Sauron. He wants, he wants ultimate power. All right. Okay. He says these Isengarders, he has taken up with foul folk with the orcs. Worse than that, he has been doing something to them, something dangerous. For these Isengarders are more like wicked men. What's he been doing? He's been breeding them with men. That's why Saruman's orcs can march during the day. See, Sauron's orcs can't. They're, they're orcs. They don't like the sun. The sunlight burns them, right? He says, Saruman's orcs can endure the sun, even if they hate it. And, and are they men he has ruined, or has he blended the races of orcs and men? That would be a black evil, right? That would be, you know, in 
Treebeard's view, and probably in Gandalf's and Elrond's and Galadriel's and all like all that, that would be like breeding humans with animals of some kind to make them stronger and able to you know do whatever. Okay, so he says, I gotta stop Saruman. He can't do it on his own, right? He, well, he's one tree, not even you know big old massive tree. Okay, so what does he do? He sets up or calls an int moot. A moot is a meeting. Hasn't happened for a long time. He doesn't know what's going to happen. And he says, even if something does happen, he doesn't know how long it'll take for it to happen. Because what kind of characterizes the habits of ints? Or the actions of ints? They're slow. You know, think of Congress. You have the House of Representatives and you have the Senate. What's one of the differences between the two? Well, the House of Representatives, they represent, you know, each member of the House represents, I don't remember what the number is now, it's something like 650, 700, 700,000 people, right? Which is why states that get more people end up getting more representatives and states that lose people end up losing a representative, right? The Senate doesn't work that way. You get two senators per state. doesn't matter how many people are there. California has 45 million people. They get two senators. Wyoming has under a million. They get two senators. It's actually part of the genius of how the Constitution was drawn up. Right? Why am I bringing this? The House of Representatives is much more clued in to the actions going on around the country day by day. You get people stand up and they deliver fire and brimstone speeches and you're, you know, pass laws willy-nilly. Spur the moment kind of stuff. What does the Senate supposedly do? What's, what's the nickname for the Senate? Anybody know? The world's greatest deliberative body. In other words, the House passes the bills, they get shunted up to the Senate, and they all get piled up here. Where it just sits. So that the Senate can talk and talk and talk. They moot. They meet and discuss. It's meant to be slower so that the passions can be stilled and calmed, etc., etc. Okay? That's what Treebeard is kind of afraid of what's going to happen at the end moot. See, he's fired up. He's ready to Lock and load, man. Let's go get Sarah Man. But he can't do it by himself. He's got to get the rest of the ants. Okay? So what happens? The ants lock and load. I mean, they're ready to go. Why? Louder. Sarah Man's killing trees. <laughs> what are trees to ants? Kin. <laughs> they're the same. Okay. Now they're not all walking, talking trees like hens, right? But they're still trees. So they have the ant moot and they march on Isengard. 487, they get there. Isengard, the valley of Isengard, is shaped like a bowl. So you've got mountains all the way around, okay? And then you go down from the mountains, or hills if you like. And around the, in Isengard itself, you have a ring of stone. Don't think like Stonehenge. Because Stonehenge, you have a stone here, and then a stone here, and you got a big old open space here. It's not very good defensively, right? So this is a solid wall of stone around it. And it's like, uh, I think we're given a description at one point, 15, 20 feet tall. I mean, massive. In the middle is this tower. Shaped like, kind of like this. Has a stairway going along the outside that winds up, right? The tower was built by the men of Westernessa. The orcs try to destroy the tower. The ints try to destroy the tower. And they can't. It's telling you something about the skills of the men of Westernessa. The wall around the outside, built by Saruman, they tear that thing down without any problem. So we get them looking down into Isengard. 
And Isengard used to be like Eden. It used to be beautiful. Trees and flowers and grass. Where I grew up, uh, first 18 years of my life, used to be called, when my parents moved there in the late 50s, it was called the Valley of Heart's Delight. Now it's called Silicon Valley. It is no one's heart's delight anymore. It's just pretty much all paved over. And it was called the Valley of Heart's Delight because there were orchards as far as you can see. Apricot orchards, plum orchards, um, other kinds of fruits and such. Almond trees. All right. Now it's like Isengard. Chapter 5, right right. So what is Tolkien done? When we begin Two Towers, where were we? Who did we see initially? Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli, right? Boromir has run off after Merry and Pippin. Okay? Frodo and Sam, they leave at the end of Fellowship of the Ring, right? That final chapter is titled Breaking of the Fellowship. It actually started breaking earlier. And Gandalf falls in Khazad-dûm. So Sam and Frodo, they've gone off to Mordor. We open the two towers, and we see Boromir run off after Merry and Pippin. Right? He gets killed. Then we have Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli. Merry and Pippin, we don't see at the beginning. We don't see them until that chapter we just skipped over at the Urca. Okay, so they're missing. They're missing. We get these. Boromir, we see die. Then we have these three go off. So, breaking of the fellowship? Yeah, it's like, I mean, it just shatters. Right? But what has Tolkien started to do here? He's got threads going. So these three are one thread. Boromir's thread has come to an end. Mary, uh, Sam and Frodo's, Sam and Frodo's thread. I almost said Sam and Frodo's thread. Um, they're not going to get picked up till much later on. Okay. Gandalf, he's dead. His thread seemingly has ended. And Mary and Pippin, their thread is you know dangling. So Tolkien's going to have these threads just kind of go everywhere. And then eventually he'll start to weave them all back together. White Rider. Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli. They're at Fangorn. And they kind of piece together the evidence of what they can see in the ground. Because they see orc footprints all over the place. And then they find a couple of hobbit footprints. Okay. And the hobbit footprints go towards Fangorn. So they follow them. For 91. They get to the eaves, just to the outskirts of Fangorn. And Frodo's looking at uh, Frodo. Get the right name. Aragorn's looking at the ground and such. And we're told that Bob before 90, at one point near the bank of the Entwash, he came upon more footprints, hobbit prints, too light for much to be made of them. And then there's a big tree, etc. And he says, one hobbit stood here, etc. And Gimme's like, uh, but we were warned against going into there, right? And Kelleborn said, steer clear of Fangorn. But the hobbits didn't. 491. Legolas says, the wood isn't evil. He's a wood elf. It's kind of like he, he goes up to a tree. It's not evil. Or what evil that is in it is far away. Okay? He says there's no malice. Okay, look, I'm, not, I'm not cutting any trees. Don't worry. He says it's old. It says, you know, this tree, this forest is so old, I almost feel young again. How old is Legolas? I think you can go back to the appendices and probably find out somewhere. I don't believe I ever have. But he's probably at least a thousand years old. He's not anywhere near as old as Elrond or Galadriel or them, right? But he's saying this really, really, really old forest makes me feel young again. Gimli says... In response to Legolas, says, I could have been happy here if I had come in days of peace. Why? Because he could have just traipsed around the forest and, you know, gone up and hugged trees and just felt wonderful. 
Gimli, I dare say you could. Middle 491. You are a wood elf anyway, though elves of any kind are strange folk. So, you like trees. Not all elves are wood elves. Elrond is not a wood elf. He doesn't live in a forest. Galadriel is a wood elf. I mean, her trees make Fangorn, you know, look very, very different. I didn't say make Fangorn look young, because it doesn't. He said, but, you know, you elves are all weird. I mean, strange enough, you're strange folk. Yet you comfort me. Where you go, I will go. Now, Tolkien plagiarizes that. Where you go, I will go. Comes from the Old Testament book of Ruth. I can I always get the two mixed up, so I'm probably gonna get it again, mixed up again. It's the character of I know I'm gonna mix up. I think it's Ruth saying to her daughter-in-law Naomi, or it's Ruth is the daughter-in-law saying to her mother-in-law Naomi, one of the two. Whither thou goest, I will go, because the daughter-in-law's husband has been killed and is not uh, Hebrew, is not Jewish. And she says, I'm going to go off with you, my mother-in-law, wherever you go, I will follow you. She eventually becomes like the grandmother, great-grandmother of King David, right? Why does Gimli say this? What's, what is this showing us? I mean, Elmer has kind of already alluded to that. I mean, here, elf and dwarf walk openly together. This is saying, Legolas, if you want to go into the deepest, darkest heart of this forest, I will go with you. When did that change occur in their relationship? In Lothlorien with Galadriel. When Galadriel speaks to Gimli in his own language, and he replies, Great are the halls of Kazadun, blah, 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 but greater yet is the face of Galadriel, you know, all that. Okay? But he says, Keep your bow ready to hand, and I'm going to keep my hand on my axe. If we go into the forest, I am going to be ready. Okay? So, they stay there. Uh, they see page 492 that evening, an old man in white. Okay. Or the night before. No, it's the night before, I believe. They see another man in white. Kind of gets closer to him. 493, they meet up. And the man says to them, Well, met indeed, my friends. I wish to speak to you. Will you come down or shall I come up? Because they're up on the shelf, this little hill. It's the exact same one, I think, that Mary and Pippin were on when they met Treebeard. So, will you come down to where I am, or do I need to come up to where you are? They don't answer, and he starts springing up. Gimli says, stop him, Legolas. The old man, did I not say to you, I wish to speak to you. Put away that bow, Master Elf, and you, Master Dwarf, take your hand off that axe. <laughs> and when he says that, Legolas drops his bow, and Gimli drops his axe. Coincidence? Okay. He gets up there quickly. <clears throat> and Gimli notices a glint of white. And the old man speaks to them again. Okay, they talk about Fangorn. Aragorn asks, what's your name? He says, don't you know it? Already? No, who is that? Hmm, I never thought of that before. Who is that kind of like? When Frodo asked Tom Bobadil, who are you, Master? Eh, what's that? Don't you know? And then he replies with, you know, who are you yourself? Alone, nameless, all alone, you know. Okay. And so he says, oh, by the way, I know what you're doing. You're tracking a couple hobbits. Don't worry, they've met up with Treebeard. Um, and I know about the errand that you're on, and uh, let's, can we sit and talk? He turns away, he sees some falling stones, and he goes to sit. And when he does, his cloak parts. And they see, beyond doubt, he was clothed beneath all in white. Gimli cries out, Saruman, where have you hidden our friends? 
He jumps up, the old man does, throws his rags beside, aside, and he's all in white. Aragorn whips out his sword. The blade, we're told, blazed with a sudden fire. Now, I like to read, and I don't know that this is the correct way to, I like to read that it literally turns to like molten iron. Because if you've ever seen a blacksmith at work, when a blacksmith pulls a piece of iron, steel, out of a forge, sometimes it will look like fire, not just red hot steel. Okay. Legolas shoots an arrow up into the sky. Gimli's, you know, axe flies from his hand. And notice who's the first one to recognize him. Legolas. Mithrandir, Mithrandir. Well, Smith, I say to you again, the elvish name for Gandalf. What is this? From the fairy story essay. This is, find the point, the great example of a new catastrophe, a sudden and miraculous grace never to be counted on to recur. Really, could you going to kill Gandalf again and have him come back from the dead a second time? That would just be preposterous, right? Aragorn, beyond all hope, you return to us in our need. What veil was over my sight? But go back a second. They gazed at him. His hair was white as snow in the sunshine. Gleaming white was his robe. The eyes under his deep brows were bright, piercing as the rays of the sun. Power was in his hand. I have no idea what that literally means. I mean, is he sitting there and like holding a, a glowing ball? It's like, wow, I can throw it where I want. Not necessarily. It just means this guy radiates power. I think I have no proof. I kind of think Rowling rips off this image partly when we're going to see at one point in the Harry Potter novels, Albus Dumbledore kind of uncloaked. The very name Albus means white, by the way. Between wonder, joy, and fear, they stood and found no words. Gandalf, you know, uh, Aragorn then says his thing. Gandalf says, yeah, that's right. I was called Gandalf. Hmm. Yeah, oh, you can still call me that. Gimli? No blame, no harm, no foul. And he walks up, kind of puts his hand on his head. Is that like, good boy, <laughs> you were trying to defend your friends. Wait, here's a treat, you know. No, I don't think that's it. I, when he puts his hand down, and we're told power was in his hand, that's like a mark of blessing. Like, it's okay, I understand. If I were you, I would have thought the same. Gimli says, middle of 495, but you are all in white. You are all in white. Gandalf, yes, I am white now. In other words, this ain't just clothing. He is white. I remember what Gandalf said when he had the little interview with Saruman earlier that he recounted in the Council of Elrond. The white light can be broken, uh, Sarah Mann says. The white page can be overwritten. And Gandalf says, in which case it is no longer white. So if it's broken or overwritten, then the white gets split, right? It becomes partially white. I mean, you get the colors of the rainbow and such. Which one is complete? Which one is whole? The white. Okay. So he's saying, I am whole. I never made this connection. I've been teaching this thing for 30 years. Never made this connection. Go back to the beginning of the shadow of the past, where he's talking to Frodo about Gollum. He hopes Gollum can find his cure before the end. And I talked about cure so that he can be whole. Gandalf is now fully whole. There's no incompletion in him. There's no darkness. There's no stain. There's no taint in him. Okay? 
Indeed, I am Sarah Man, one might almost say, as he should have been. See, Sarah Man was the leader of the wizards. There are five wizards. Sarah Man the White, Gandalf the Grey, Radicast the Brown, and two others who are not named, at least not in the Lord of the Rings. Okay? One was blue, and I think the other was green or red, something like that. He's saying, I'm what Sarah Man should have been. But he wasn't because his designs were on something else. Okay. I've passed through fire and deep water since we parted. I've forgotten much. So tell me what's been going on with you. So they talk. And he mentions that the hobbits are with Treebeard. And he says, top of 490, eh, about a third, fourth away, 496. You have not said all that you know or guess, Aragorn, my friend. Poor Boromir. What does he mean you haven't said all that you know or guess? Did Aragorn tell Legolas and Gimli that Boromir tried to take the ring from Frodo? I think, I think the implication is no. He kept that to himself. Gandalf, notice, picks up on that. Why and how? We're told earlier he can read minds. Poor Boromir. I could not see what happened to him. It was a sore trial for such a man. What does he mean by such a man? A warrior and a lord of men. He's saying any man like Boromir a warrior and a lord of men would be hard-pressed in that situation. It's, it's almost his way of saying, you can't really blame him. Is Aragorn a warrior and a lord of men? Yes, he actually is. His men are up in the north. Well, not for long. Um... Is he a warrior like Boromir is? I mean, does he wear armor? No, he doesn't. He's, you know, he's Strider. He's that silent sentinel that we talked about before. Why did it prove a sore trial for Boromir? What did Gandalf say when Frodo offered him the ring? Do not tempt me. Why? I will have such need of it. See, a warrior, a born warrior, and leader of men. Think of what he could do with that ring. His men would not have to die. But, Galadriel told me that he was in peril, but he escaped in the end. I am glad. It was not in vain that the young hobbits came with us, if only for Boromir's sake. What does he mean he escaped in the end? Escaped what? Why is he glad the hobbits were there? Because the hobbits brought him back to himself. The hobbits made him, this is one way of reading that, the hobbits made him come to his senses. I think it actually, his coming to his senses begins before that. As soon as Frodo puts the ring on, I mean, it's within minutes, Frodo, what have I done? Forgive me, Frodo. It was the ring, and it was. That's when he starts coming to his senses, okay? Why does he say again, it was not in vain that the hobbits came? What would have happened to Boromir if Merry and Pippin had not been with them? We can't say specifically. What can we say would not have happened to him? He wouldn't have died. Why? Because he believes that he died for his people's sake. He would not have given his life trying to protect them. 
Greater love hath no man than that he is willing to lay down his life for his friend, Christ says. Okay. Again, Tolkien's Catholicism is woven throughout the entire novel without him ever mentioning a specific act that relates to Christianity or to the Bible. Either. You get snippets, okay? It's part of the atmosphere of the work, okay? <coughs> so he says... They were brought to Fangorn, and their coming was like the falling of small stones that starts an avalanche in the mouth. So, Bormir died trying to save them. That was his cure. That's what made him whole. Okay. But then they were brought to Fangorn, and he says, and that was like the beginning of an avalanche by the dropping of small stones. And everyone's like, would you quit with the sneaking riddles? Speak clearly. I'm not speaking of riddles. I understand it perfectly what I mean. What does he mean? What happens as a result of Mary Pippin going to Fangorn? Next chapter. Uh, no, not next chapter. Two, three chapters ahead. Isengard gets destroyed. Saruman is deposed, essentially. Why? Because they talked to Treebeard. And Treebeard calls the Entmoot in the Ents March. And Isengard is destroyed. And Saruman is overthrown. Okay. Go back even farther. Why is Gandalf here now? We're going to find out in just a couple pages. He's going to tell us the story. What happened when he and the Balrog fought? Okay. They talk. And I'm going to skip a bit. 499, they talk about Treebeard and the Ents, etc., etc. And let me not hold the thought about Gandalf becoming Gandalf the White in a second. 499. They talk about the Ents. Okay. And Legolas says, Where are the hobbits now? Gandalf with Treebeard and the Ents. Aragorn. The Ents? What? There's truth in the old legends about the dwellers in the deep forest and the giant shepherds of the trees. Notice, usually we have Aragorn saying, of course there's truth in the stories. Now we have Aragorn going, oh, that's a, I remember hearing that on my mother's knee, you know, the story about the walking trees. And Legolas is like, fairy stories? No, every elf in Wilderland has sung songs. He says, man, if I were to meet one of those, then I would really feel young, okay? But he's like, I don't know this name, Treebeard. Who's Treebeard? And I kind of like the image. Go to, go to South Carolina. Go to Charleston. And just look at the big old oak trees with the massive amounts of Spanish moss hanging down from them. I don't know that Tolkien has in mind. He probably has in mind other kind of moss or something like that from trees in England. But, you know, this tree with this moss dangling from it, that's the beard. Treebeard is Fangorn, the guardian of the forest. He is the oldest of the Ents, the oldest living thing that still walks beneath the sun. Pause. Time out. Because somebody already told us. He was the oldest living thing. Eldest. That's what I am. And then what does that character say? Tom was here before the first raindrop. Tom was here before the first tree. Tom was here before the world was changed. Tom was here before the dark power came from outside. How do you juxtapose those two? Is this one of the errors that Tolkien alludes to in the foreword when he says there are some problems, but I'm not going to tell you what they are? Could be. Or it could be that one of these two characters doesn't live or have life the way we think of it as? Like, maybe Tom doesn't just live under the sun as it now is. Let's look at the phrase. That walks beneath the sun upon this middle earth. Because Tom says, I was here before the sun. And Tom was, in Tolkien's cosmology. There wasn't a sun and a moon when the elves woke up. The light was given by the light of the two trees of Alador, etc., which we find out later. Okay? So, 
they keep talking. And bottom of 500. Gandalf says, you've got to go to Metasilt, Theoden's Hall, the Golden Hall, before you can go after the, the hobbits. All right? What is one reason why they have to go there? They have to return the horses. They promised. Okay. And Aragorn says, you know, that's going to be a long walk. But I'll go, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Gandalf says, okay, you come with me. Um, and Aragorn says, we have the dark, we have the white rider. The dark Lord has his nine. This is page 501. But he's passed through the fire and abyss. We'll go where he leads. Okay. But Legolas, while they're kind of walking, he's like, come on, Gandalf, spill the beans. What happened? And so he tells them says, so we fell when the bridge broke. We fell, and we fell, and we fell, and we fell. Finally, we hit water. We came out of the water, and we started, started running up the endless stair. All right? And we ran, and ran, and ran, and ran, and it went all the way to the top of the mountain. And at the top of the mountain, there was a doorway. I don't think you need a doorway with an actual little literal door, but like a cave opening, the mouth of a cave. And he says, and as soon as the Balrog went out of the mountain, he burst back into flame. Okay. 502. There was none to see, or perhaps in after ages songs would still be sung at the Battle of the Peak. Notice that. There will be no song of that battle. Why? Nobody was there to witness it. This idea is going to be brought up later on between Aragorn and Eowyn, okay? That the only reason there are legends and stories is because there was somebody there to tell it. You know, the other day when I mentioned the stuff about Flight 93, the guys who brought the plane down into Pennsylvania, the only reason we know about that is why. Yeah. They were on the telephone with their wives and businesses, okay? And the wives and businesses were saying, yeah, they think your flight is headed towards the Capitol building. Okay, we got to stop this, you know. Nobody saw this. So the only account is the little bit that Gandalf gives us, all right? So he said, what would they say if somebody had seen it? Those that looked up from afar thought that the mountain was crowned with storm. Now that's telling us Gandalf, I think it's telling us, Gandalf has spoken with someone who saw what happened from a distance. And it looked like there was fire and lightning on the mountain. Okay. Thunder they heard and lightning they said, smote upon Calabdil, leaped back, broken into tongues of fire. He says, isn't that enough to tell you? A great smoke rose about us, vapor and steam, ice fell like rain. I threw down my enemy, he fell from the high place, broke the mountainside where he smote it in his ruin. Then darkness took by the way, that image of his enemy being thrown down and smiting the, the mountainside, it's from either Ezekiel or Daniel. And it's the description of Lucifer when he's cast out of heaven and lands on the earth. This here, this is the image Dante presents in his inferno of hell. It's a big hole in the ground. And at the very base of the hole is Satan. And the hole was created by his plunging into the ground. Like when a meteor hits, or an asteroid hits, it creates what? A big old crater. Okay. He says, Then darkness took me, and I strayed out of thought and time. What does that mean? He strayed out of thought and time. Does that mean he's hallucinating? He's unconscious, he's in a coma? No. How do you stray out of time? You leave time behind. Yeah, you die. See, time is a constraint of what? The physical world. I don't mean this world, but in our world we would call it 
the universe, right? The one verse, the one thing. Now, if, if there are multiverses, it kind of, you know, blows that away. But time exists within that constraint of however big the universe is. Right? He says, I went outside that. And I wandered far on roads I will not tell. He doesn't mean literal roads. He just means I wandered. And he doesn't mean physically. Naked I was sent back for a brief time until my task is done. What does he mean by naked? Does he mean literally without clothes? I think yes. I think it has two meanings. I think he means he was sent naked back from being beyond time and thought. So how can you be naked if you're outside time? This morning while driving here, I was listening to Classic FM. It's a British radio station. And uh, played all classical music. And they were discussing um, the coffin carrying the body of the former queen. Notice how I made that construction. They were carrying the body of the former queen. And the announcer said, and her majesty is being taken too. Okay. And I thought to myself, well, that's not right. There, there is no more Her Majesty. Why? She was passed away. The Queen is no more. The Queen's body is there. Assume for let me assume for a moment that you all believe in the concept of a soul or consciousness that exists outside the body. There is no consciousness in that body anymore. It is what at this point? Dead. It's, keep going. It's just a corpse. It, you know, if we lived in a different time and age, that, might, that body might be placed out in a field somewhere to feed animals, like wild animals. Let them come get it, you know. But we don't. Right? She's not there anymore. Queen Elizabeth ain't home anymore. The lights are out. The doors are closed. She's somewhere else. And there's been all kinds of internet memes of, you know, going to meet Prince uh, Philip and blah, blah, blah. Okay? Naked I was sent back. Initially, I think it refers to Gandalf's soul, consciousness, being, however you want to call that, was sent back. What is that soul consciousness being? I mentioned it. What day last week? Gandalf is what? If you ask, what are you, Gandalf? He's a Maya. He is one of those supernatural beings. In, in the Christian cosmology, he'd be an angel. Can you unmake an angel? No. No. Why? Because they don't have any physical being, all right? Big difference between the Christian cosmology and Tolkien's here. So, naked you sent back, that is, the consciousness, the soul, the Maya being was sent back, okay? And naked I lay upon the mountaintop, and he lay there alone, naked, etc., and he hears all this stuff, and why here the wind lord shows up. Now, Naked I was sent back, and then naked I lay upon the mountaintop. I think that naked, the second one, has a different meaning than the first one. He was sent back, the mind, consciousness, soul, or whatever, and then when he enters time, this is given back. Rephrase that. He gets a new this. Because what is it now? It's white. It's not gray. Right? Gray is white with a little tincture of color to it. Usually a dark color to make it somewhat. He's, now he's, though, pure white. Okay? 
in Guajira, the wind lord comes. Why? How? Is he just soaring around one day and joining those nice updrafts? And, oh, look, there's Gandalf laying on the top of that mountain. No. Once they talk to Galadriel, what does she start doing? No, he can't be dead. Or, you know, he might be dead, but he can't be dead for good kind of a thing. I think it's Galadriel that sees from afar. Remember, elves have good sight. Okay? She can see, I think, from the tree, so that when they come and they tell her what happens, she kind of goes along with the story. Now, I don't know that at that point, when they are up in her treehouse revealing things to her, I don't know if she knows or if at that point Gandalf has already been sent back. I don't know if he has already fought the Balrog. I think he has because a number of days have gone by. All right. So, um, and he brings words from Galadriel to them. The words to Aragorn are essentially, remember the paths of the dead. The dark is the path, dark is the path appointed for thee, and the dead watch the road that leads to the sea. Legolas and Gimli, they don't have a clue what that means. Aragorn knows intimately what it means. Because this is a prophecy that he must fulfill. That goes back thousands of years. Okay? She brings word also to Legolas. Beware the sea. If thou hearest the cry of the gull on the shore, thy heart shall then rest in the forest no more. If you hear that sound of the seagull, why will his heart not rest in the forest anymore? Does it mean he wants to move to Florida? <laughs> Have a nice beachfront property? It'll mean he'll be drawn to the sea. Why? Because the sea, it doesn't mean he'll become a sailor. They'll want to go over the ocean. They'll want to go back to Valinor or to Valinor. They'll be drawn to that. He will never have peace here. Okay? And in Tolkien, I shouldn't go there. In Tolkien's cosmology, elves are fixed, fixed to this world that is. Arda, the created, whether you call it Earth, the whole universe, etc. They're tied to it. Humanity isn't. Humanity is meant, in Tolkien's cosmology, for somewhere else. To be with Iru Iluvatar. Which is why death is called the gift of Iru to men. When, and he, he actually mentions this, in some of the... Um, Drafts of the fairy story essay, because he's trying to work it out in his own mind, that when this world is destroyed at the end of time, so to speak, the elves will finally be gone. I mean, gone, gone. You, you won't meet Galadriel or Elrond in heaven. You will meet, ultimately, Aragorn. And, you know, I don't know, maybe Boromir. Fairmere, yeah. probably, you know. Bill Fernie, no, he's going to go to the other place. <laughs> Gimli, hello, oh, what about me? Surely she had a message for me. And Legos are like, oh, Gimli, you don't want to hear these words. These are not good words. I want you to hear even if she foretold your death. Yes. And Gandalf's like, oh, yeah, I forgot Gimli. Give his lady's greeting, lock bearer. Wherever thou goest, my thoughts goes, my thought goes with thee. What does that mean? Again, I you know, I can't help but but think of lovers. Wherever you go, my thoughts are with you. Now, that should make you go, oh, thanks, honey. And what does Gimli do? In happy hour you have returned to us, Gandalf, cried the dwarf, 
capering as he sang loudly in the strange dwarf tongue. What does it mean to caper? It's like dancing a jig. Think of a, you know, a Scots band, somebody playing the fiddle, somebody blowing on a bagpipe, and he's sitting here dancing this jig. He's just overjoyed that she has said this because it means wherever you go, Gimli, I am with you. Lock bearer. He's got three strands of her hair. Where did the hair grow from? Grew from her head. The implication, this is metaphorically, right? As long as you have these three strands of hair, I am with you always. It's kind of like, you know, whither thou goest, I will go, kind of a thing. So, they make their way to the Golden Hall. They go by a burial mound, and Aragorn chants a song. That song is based upon an old English poem called The Wanderer that has in it these lines that are called the Ubi Sunt motif. Latin just means where are. Okay. And one thing that Peter Jackson does really good, I think it's in the extended edition, is when Aragorn sings this in the film, it's in Old English. Because the Rohirrim are based on Anglo-Saxons. Right. Um, they go to the Golden Hall, they're told to lay aside their weapons, and then they can go in. And Gandalf's like, I'm not leaving my staff. I'm an old man. You know, does the whole bit. And the door warden says, okay. And they go in, and it's dark inside, and they're greeted by Wormtongue. And Gandalf speaks for a moment with Theoden, and then Wormtongue speaks. And Wormtongue Page 514 says some things about Galadriel. And Gimli gets a little angry and he steps forward and grabs his axe. Okay. And Gandalf sings. And then he says to Wormtongue, the wise speak only of what they know, Grima, son of Galmod, a witless Worm have you become, therefore be silent, keep your fork tongue behind your teeth. I have not passed through fire, and and now he makes it clear. Death. Okay. To bandy words with you. He raises his staff, there's lightning, all the light goes out, essentially, worm tongues on, on his face. There's now no light coming through the windows. Again, he points his staff to one window. And think, you know, almost think of it like this, you know, the block on this wall. And that very last block in that top corner, light suddenly shines. You can see a little patch of blue sky. The rest of the room is dark. Fire in the middle of the room, in the middle of the hearth. No fireplace and chimney. The smoke just goes up from the fire and goes through a hole in the roof. Designed after an Anglo-Saxon hall. And Gandalf now addresses... Theoden, do you ask for help? Points to the window, a little bit of light. Not all is dark. Take courage, Lord of the Mark, for better help you will not find. No counsel have I give to those, have I to give to those that despair. Counsel, I could give words, I could speak to you. Will you hear them? They're not for all ears. That is, I could give you some counsel, but it's not for worm tongue to hear, and it's not for your niece to hear, and it's not for the others around here to hear. It's for you. But notice, do you ask for help? And I can give counsel, but not to those that despair. Why not? Why can't he give counsel to those that despair? Despair comes from de space. Out of out of hope. If you have no hope, what does it good if someone tries to come and give you a pep talk? It doesn't do any good. You know, this is National Suicide Prevention Month. If someone is literally seconds away from pulling the trigger, and you're with them, 
Your saying no isn't going to stop them. I mean, if they are that far gone, if there is no hope, nothing you do or say can stop them. The hope has got to begin where? It's got to be inside. There's got to be however much an inkling, an ounce, a glimmer of light is. There's got to be a still that element that says, okay, you know, when Luke says to Darth Vader, there is still good in you. And he says, no, there is. It is too late for me. By saying it's too late for me, it's not. He still is indicating there's a tiniest sliver. All right? So I can, I can give you hope. I can help you. But you've got to want it. So... Slow, slowly, Thanon leaves his chair. And notice, as he leaves, what happens in the room, in the hall? It starts to get light. Or it gets lighter. Is that because Gandalf's off at the side, you know, turning up the dimmer switches? <laughs> well, this is good special effects here. We'll just, as he rises, we'll keep going. Cue that spotlight right there, gentlemen. No. And notice, by the way, I didn't point this out my first time. So if you've seen the film, notice how totally different this scene is from that abomination. And I don't use that word accidentally. Because they have Gandalf essentially point his staff at Saruman and perform an exorcism. Because we see Saruman's face, uh, Thanon's face twist. And there's Christopher Lee, and then there's Terraman, and then there's Christopher Lee, and he's like, I cast you out. Freaking morons. <laughs> right? It's not what happens. Why? The faint light grows in the hall, and Eowyn runs to his side to help him. She helps him up, and they go to the doors, and the doors are opened. And Gandalf says, Tell your guards to leave. Why? Because the words he has are for Theoden. And he says, you lady, leave him with me. Notice, she doesn't listen to Gandalf. Why? He's not her lord. So don't you tell me to leave my uncle's side. Go away. It's when Theoden says, go, Eowyn, sister daughter. She turns and goes aside, and we get this little brief scene. Aragorn sees her for the first time, and it's kind of like, mm, 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 mm. and she looks at him, she's like, damn, that is a fine-looking man. Looks like he ought to be, you know, on a stone, you know, thing. And Gandalf takes him out to the porch. So he's looking down, there's steps, and off in the distance... What does he see? They could see beyond the stream, the green fields of Rowan fading into distant gray. Curtains of windblown rain were slanting down. The sky above and to the west was still dark with thunder. Lightning far away flickered among the tops of hidden hills. But the wind had shifted to the north. All right? And already the storm that had come out of the east. Why the east? Mordor. The storm had come out of the east, okay, was now what? Dissipating, blowing away to the south, and disappearing. Okay. Suddenly, through a rent in the clouds behind them, notice they can't see this, but it's behind them because they're standing here, and the hall is right behind them, right? So there's clouds behind and above, and the clouds open up, and a shaft of sunlight comes down. The falling showers that they looked at out there that were grayish, slanting down, gleamed like silver. Like silver falling from the sky. And far away, the river glittered like a glimmering, like a shimmering glass. What has they had just experienced? from the fairy story essay. He's almost, I think, gotten all four things. Fantasy, escape, recovery, 
happy ending. Not literally, or the eucatastrophe at least. But of those four, he's got recovery in spades, man. I mean, he, he's got the whole deal here. It is not so dark here. Here? Here where? Literally where they're standing and looking up. Go back in the hall, close the doors, kill the lights, and it's still kind of dark there. <clears throat> but this is a metaphor. The whole image is serving as a metaphor for what? His enlightenment up here. Gandalf, no. Nor does age lie so heavily on your shoulders as some would have you think. He's standing, supporting himself on that cane. How old is he? He's younger than me. Yeah, I can't believe that. So she thinks either I'm really old or he's late 40s, early 50s. No, I'm kidding. He's late 40s, early 50s. Aragorn knew his father. Hello. Okay, he knew his father as well as Amr's father, right? And so he drops the staff and he does this. It's like I do in the morning. And he stands up straight. Now tall and straight he stood and his eyes were blue as he looked into the opening sky. Now, that's a wonderful image because it can mean what? His eyes are reflecting the blue of the sky. It almost is described like before he had cataracts. You know, the gray cloudiness that elderly people often get? Not anymore. Dark have been my dreams of late, he said, but I feel as one new awakened. <clears throat> Meaning, he sees as he was meant to see. Now he sees clearly. The old song from the early 70s. I can see clearly now the rain has gone. Where did the rain come from? Where did the darkness in his mind come from? Worm tongue. Just think of a name. Like a tongue that burrows like a worm into his mind because worm tongue has put ideas into his mind. Now, I always use this image. Take two children from birth. Have one child raised in a home where the child is never given any positive reinforcement, where the child is never told that he is loved, that he is valuable, that he is worth, of, you know, of infinite worth. And where the child is told, you're a sorry piece of, you know, you know what, and you will never amount to anything. Go after yourself. And the child is told that from day one to his 12th birthday. The other child is raised by a family that says, you are of infinite value. We love you more than anything. It's, home is full of books, and you can be anything you want to be as long as you work hard. What kind of people are you going to have on the 12th birthday of those two children? The other person's going to have a more positive outlook on life, will probably be a high achiever in school and such. The person over here is more likely already going to be involved with the law. If you're told you're not any good and you'll never amount to anything. Guess what's going to happen? You're not going to be any good and you're not going to amount to anything. It's impossible to break out of that kind of straitjacket. Well, that is what has happened to Thayer. That's why Gandalf says, if you despair, okay. So, Thayer's given his sword back. Aomer is released whole nine yards, and they march to Isengard, first to Helm's Deep. But before they go, um, what choice is given to Warm Tongue? What can he do? To ride with them or ride against them. He can go and serve his king, prove his loyalty, or 
go back to your master's servant. And what did he choose? He spits in Theoden's face, literally, and then writes the servant. So he's made his choice. Okay. Then they go off to Helm's Deep. Why? We have to have a battle. <coughs> so, in the two towers, Helm's Deep, the entire chapter, is 16 pages. The Battle of Helm's Deep is nine pages. So the chapter with that title is 16 pages. The actual battle part of it is only nine pages. Big freaking deal, right? The film, The Two Towers, The Battle of Helm's Deep is over one-fourth of the entire film. And that film, if I remember right, is almost two and a half hours long. Why make the battle scene so big, so extensive? I mean, The Two Towers, the book, is 400-some pages, and the entire chapter is only 16. I mean, it's not even a tenth, fifth, not even a 5% of the whole book. Because Peter Jackson doesn't understand what Tolkien is doing. Peter Jackson thinks... The Lord of the Rings, or at least his film, betrays this mindset. Thinks the Lord of the Rings is sword and sorcery. It's Dungeons and Dragons writ large in literary form. Because of that, a lot of people thought, when the films came out, that Tolkien celebrated, valorized is the code word that was used an awful lot, warfare in war when the exact opposite was the truth Tolkien was the truth Tolkien hated war because of his experiences in World War I and because of the fact that by night by the time he was 26 years old in 1918 at the end of World War I all but one of his closest friends were dead you know that generation of Englishmen who fought in that war they're called the lost generation because of the millions. You cannot go to a town. I'm not kidding. Literally anywhere in England today that does not have a war memorial to the dead of World War I. Anywhere. Because they lost so many. I mean, an entire generation of young men wiped out. Right? We're not going to really say anything else. Things look bad. But... Sun rises tomorrow, hope, you know, spring's eternal. Gandalf comes to the rescue. What do we not see in the battle that Peter Jackson and his wife decide to introduce into the Lord of the Rings? And because it's been introduced, it can never be unintroduced. If you talk to someone and they say, oh, yes, yeah, I saw that film, I love to see where. What will everybody think is somehow in The Lord of the Rings? That Tolkien threw in, and I use the term threw intentionally, dwarf tossing. D literal dwarf tossing. Here, let's throw Gimli from here to over there so he can help fight over there. It's literally in the film. When the film came out, guess who was upset about that? People who suffered from dwarfism. They thought they were being made fun of. And who wouldn't, right? Out of the essence. So, the road to Isengard. They make their way to Isengard. And what do they find when they get there? It's already spoiled. Pardon? It's already, like it's already been destroyed. The stone ring around it has been all knocked down. The tower still stands, because while the Ents tried to destroy it, they couldn't, because it was made by the men of Western Us. The ring was not, right? What else do they find? Literally, when they get there, there's these two little figures sitting on a slab of stone with smoke coming out of their mouths, okay? Smoking some weed and drinking some beer. I mean, you gotta love hobbits. Um, and so, you know, 
they reconnect with Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli, and they explain what happened to them. Gandalf and Theoden, meanwhile, go off to inspect what's been going on. Chapter 10, Voice of Ceremony. We're not going to get nearly as far into here as I wanted to. So, Gandalf says, I've got to go talk with Ceremony. He says, Aragorn's coming with me. Notice, Aragorn doesn't even get the choice. He doesn't say, Aragorn, would you like to come? It's just, Aragorn's coming with me. Okay. Theoden's going. Why? So, so far, why those three? Gandalf has unfinished business. Okay. He's got to do something before he leaves. Theoden, he's... Sarah Man's neighbor. Sarah Man's been, you know, think of a property dispute. Sarah, Man, Sarah Man's been reaching over the fence and cutting down his trees. Not a good thing to do. So he's got to deal with that. Um, Theoden's trees, so to speak. Um, Treebird doesn't go up because he can't go up the stairs. He's fine standing down. Aragorn, because he's intimately tied with this place. It was made by his ancestors. Okay? So, who else wants to go? Gimli says, Legolas and I are coming. They're going to represent their kindred. So you have men, elves, dwarves, wizards. What about Mary and Pippin? Why don't they go up? They apparently don't want to. I mean, Gandalf does warn them. Okay? And Pippin says, what will he do, you know? Will he shoot at us or pour fire again or put a spell on us? Gandalf says, the latter most likely. Okay. So Gandalf goes up. Wormtongue comes out. He says, go away. Send your master out. Saruman comes out. We get a description of Saruman, page 578. And we get a description of his voice. It's sweet and mellifluous and you just love hearing this person talk. Okay. And Gimli says, at the bottom of 578, like and yet unlike. Because he's looking at Gandalf and then he looks at Saruman. Similar, but not the same. Okay. So Saruman says, two of you I know. There's Gandalf and then and son of Thingol. And then he goes on to describe Theoden and his house, how? Oh, great and mighty, it's like the Wizard of Oz. Oh, great and mighty Oz. Oh, great and mighty Theoden, blah, 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 blah. Okay. He says, I can help you. Do you want my help? Theoden opens his mouth to speak, but doesn't. So first, oh, let's just go ahead and call it temptation. All right? Gimli does, though. Gimli says... The words of this wizard stand on their heads in the language of Orthanc. Help me to ruin. Saving means saving. That is plain. What do you mean? Help means ruin. Saving means slain. Now, I kind of joked in my first class. It's almost like Tolkien has read his George Orwell by the time he gets to here. Orwell, famously, in 1984, he creates doublespeak. Okay? Where freedom is slavery. War is peace. Knowledge is ignorance. Right? Gimli, notice, sees through the spell. And what does Saruman do? Peace. But he says it in such a way that it's, it's not as suave. It's not as cool. And then he addresses Gimli by name. How? Are they wearing name tags? Hi, my name's Gimli. <laughs> no. It's because he's a wizard. If Gandalf can read minds, stands to think, so can Sermon. He says, I'm sure you've done great stuff, but this is not your fight. He addresses Theoden again, second time. He says, what have you to say? Shall we take our counsel together against evil days? Blah, blah, blah. Still Theoden doesn't answer. Amir does. Amir calls him a liar, and then he pulls out, you know, his coup de grace. Look at what he says, top of 580. Will you party with this dealer in treachery and murder? Remember Theodred at the forge and the grave of Hama in Elm's Deep. Now, who is Theodred and what's the forge? What is he talking about? 
Theodred was Theoden's son, who was hacked to death defending women and children who were attacked, a civilian settlement attacked by Saruman's forces. So lots wrong there. One, he attacked women and children. You don't do that in war. Civilians are supposedly off limits, okay? Two, after Theodred was killed, he was hacked into pieces. There's an old idea in war, and it literally goes back thousands of years, that when your opponent is dead, you leave the body alone because the body is somehow sacred. That's what got Achilles in such trouble in the Iliad when he drags Hector's body around the field until body parts start to fall off. Even the gods turn against him at that point. Okay? So, if we speak of poison tongues, what shall we say of yours, young serpent? And then Sermon catches himself. Oops, oops, sorry. Amir, son of Ammon, you are just a gun in your master's hand. Shut up. He says, yours is not counsel and diplomacy. You're just the tip of the spear. Go kill whom you told to kill. Third time. And I know time's up. He says, shall we have peace and friendship? You and I, it is ours to command. And Theoden says, yes, we will have peace. And the writers are, yay, we get to go home. When will they have peace, according to Theoden? When you hang from the gibbet, when you are hanging from a gallows, and crows are picking out your eyes, then we'll have peace. Okay. We'll pick up there, and we'll never finish Lord of the Rings. We'll just, <laughs> we'll just say, screw Harry Potter. And... No, we'll finish it sometime. <laughs>